guys. Welcome to another Mental Health Monday. I'm, I'm here today with a really awesome person. Buttons. Listen, the buttons are hard. The buttons are hard. For real. Hello. Hello. Bite. You were first. Rocker, you were second, but you didn't type first, so you don't get to be first. <laughs> Triz gets to be second. <laughs> hey, Angel Me. Hello. How are you? Who's that person? Who knows? Who knows? This is just somebody. I don't know. I don't know this person at all. No. Uh, happy Mental Health Monday. Thank you so much for being here and joining us today. I'm super excited for tonight's conversation. I think it's going to be great. I do have my headset plugged in because it died right before we were going to get started here. So now I have that pesky cord that I'm going to be messing with and I just put it behind me. So hopefully it'll, that'll help. But Super fortunate to have Janie here with us today. She is a certified occupational therapist, assistant, and therapy program manager, specializing in the geriatric population, and also specializing in um, making sure that I'm taking care of my own hands with the therapy. <laughs> <laughs> she also has experience with working with the developmentally delayed disabled population. She's a multicultural transplant born in um, Tegu. Is that how you say that? Tegu? Mm-hmm. South yep. Korea and adopted as a baby. Most of her life has been spent living all over the Midwest, although she did spend brief amounts of time on the East and West Coast. She lived in Seoul, uh, South, South Korea. Boy, my mouth just doesn't like to work sometimes. For three years during primary age, and her personal struggles and diagnosis are major depressive disorder, recurrent generalized anxiety, and cultural identity struggles. As she's gotten older, she finds it strange to feel even more connected to her heritage and culture now than when she was a kid living in Korea, but it was something that was also a huge issue for her as a kid. Jamie has three cats and one black lab and currently resides in Wichita, Kansas. She's currently playing a lot of DVD, which we've played together also, uh, Apex and It Takes Two, which we played Apex together, and I always feel sorry whenever we play Apex together because I'm so... <laughs> Awful. Oh, but, it's just but listen, it's fine. <laughs> I can spray and pray all day. <laughs> mm -hmm. But thank you so much for joining us today to talk about cultural sensitivity, racism, and resources for Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders. I'm really excited to dive into this. So just thank you for being here. I'm really, I'm yeah. really uh, happy to have you. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. So um, I do have some resources and links for you guys today. Also, fun fact, her username is not Random Lime, and I did for the longest time <laughs> think that it was Random Lime, and it wasn't, it was just, you know, just how it, just how it was. <laughs> just what I thought it was. And apparently there is a 500 character limit, so I'm going to post these resources separately from your Twitter, but there we go. Uh... Hey, Majestant. Um, I'm glad you think that the, the guest tonight is hot. Now, hopefully you will keep most of your comments tame and in nature, and you're welcome to stay and share your authentic selves and ask questions if you would like. And relevant to the conversation. Relevant to the conversation. Let's keep mm -hmm. it that way. Absolutely. So you have three cats and one dog. Yes. Um, well, one of them... I adopted, she will be three, oh, four, four in September. Yeah, she's already three. Um, I adopted her a few years ago, almost three years ago. She was seven months um, when I lived in Kansas City. And then w when I moved here, there was already two cats <laughs> and a dog. So we just kind of became this big, happy animal family. <laughs> yeah. So you had a cat already. Do you consider yourself mm -hmm. a dog person or a cat person? Um, I would say whale cat for sure. Um, I actually had a huge fear of dogs growing up. My mom had a college friend that we would go and see like a few times a year and they were best friends in college. And then her friend also had adopted international kids as well. So they, we, and the oldest daughter was only a year older than me and she was adopted from the Ukraine. So we would go and like have play dates every now and then. And they had, I don't even remember the name. I don't remember the kind of dog. I'm sure, I think it was mixed. But every time we walked into their house, the dog who was not very well behaved would jump on me Aww. and knock me to the ground. And so yeah. as a kid, it kind of developed this fear of like big dogs. Right. But I couldn't be happier with our dog. Our dog is so well behaved. Like if I was going to be ever be a dog owner, which I think I used to think I wouldn't ever be. I mean, that would be the dog I'd pick. She's wonderful. Yeah. Her name's Belle. <laughs> don't get don't get a uh, 
whatever Ruger is, because boy, does he have so much energy and love to jump for sure. <laughs> He's a great dog. Don't get me wrong. <laughs> Uh, we do have a um, question queue open. So if you would like to enter into a question, just like Bite Mark did there, exclamation point queue, that'll put it into the question queue. And you can have it in there and make sure that I see it. Otherwise, just put your questions in the chat and we'll we'll get to them. Don't know what language that is, Majestin, but one of the uh, rules here is please use English. So use English or fuck off, please. Uh, don't get a Weimaraner. Oh my God, I had a Weimaraner. My sweet, sweet Weimaraner died. Um... <laughs> Sweet, sweet Weimaraner died, and he was a great dog, but he was an idiot. Total and complete idiot. I hear they can be. <laughs> yeah? Yes. Yeah. Are those those dogs that are kind of blue, bluish, grayish? Yes. Mm -hmm. I think, yep. okay. Yeah. Yeah. He was a ding dong, would fetch all day, like hurt himself fetching all day. So how did you get into occupational therapy and what do you love or, and what do you hate about it? Uh, well, it was kind of a long story short. It was a, I wasn't really sure what I wanted to do at the time, but I knew I wanted to help people. So that was just something I kind of picked, um, out of high school. Um, my dad wanted me to major in chemistry. I was really good at chemistry, but I thought it was incredibly, incredibly boring. He's like, well, you'd make a lot of money as a pharmacist. I'm thinking, yeah, but it's super boring. <laughs> and then other people told me, well, why don't you go into teaching? Because both your parents are teachers, so it'd be a natural kind of like segue into what you would do with your life. And I was like, well, I don't really want to be teachers. I know firsthand having two parents that are teachers, how underappreciated <laughs> teachers really are and how yeah. underpaid they are. And that wasn't something I was interested in. Um, so, uh, when I met my soon to be sister-in-law, I met her when I was 17. Um, and she had just, she was, she had just graduated with a speech language pathology degree. And, uh, I went up for a college visit. I went to the same college my brother did and I went and shadowed her in some classes and I'm thinking, oh, okay, healthcare. I don't want to be a nurse. I'm not interested in being a doctor, but this is still helping people and in healthcare, but without getting my hands dirty all the time, I guess, for lack of a better term. So when I went to school, I pretty much just picked that because I didn't know what I wanted to do, but I ended up falling in love with, you know, the whole process. And, and my major at the time was communication disorders. So I took a lot, a lot of courses on like audiology and um, communication disorders and development classes type stuff like that. But after my sophomore year, I couldn't afford to go back to the college um, it was a private Christian college that didn't accept um, most like scholarships, so a lot of the kids paid out of pocket to go there. Ooh. And um, yeah, it was it was pretty bad. So I transferred home to work and kind of pay off some of that school debt. And uh, I didn't have any intentions of going back. Um, there was nothing wrong with the program. It was actually a really good program, and I really enjoyed it. Um, but I just. This, this, the college wasn't for me, so <laughs> I pretty much went there because my parents wanted me to go, and that's where my brother went, so by proxy, I went there. Um, so anyway, I got home and went to the local community college to see, you know, like, what would transfer over, and uh, they told me that none of my credits would transfer, which was super, super upsetting at the time because I had yeah. 62 credits. Yeah, I had 62 credits. Um, and so they told me none of my credits would transfer, so I had to start all over the basic English courses, and I think I, no, I tested out of English. I paid, I took a CLEP test, it was 100 bucks, and I tested out of English, because I was not taking another English course. Mm -hmm. um, I had to take a speech class again, I had to do all the basics, and I said, well, I don't really want to start over, because to become a licensed speech language pathologist, it's six years of schooling, and I'm like, God, if I start over, that's going to be eight years of my life that I'm right. <laughs> going to get back. So at the time I was like, well, what, what is there that's kind of similar, but not that my dad, who was a teacher and he's also a respiratory therapist at one of the local hospitals in Kansas city. He said, well, what about occupational therapy? I'm like, what the heck is that? So <laughs> he pretty much explained what it was. And I looked up, um, a college in the area, our actual community college had a program and I heard really good things about it. So I applied kind of thinking nothing at the time I was working um, in special education at the local middle school. 
um, with the severely developmentally disabled, I was a para for um, a kid with autism and then also a student that had uh, Down syndrome as well. So I was doing that full time and I was working at Chick-fil-A too at the time in the evening and I was taking night courses. So I was like really busy at the time. I think I was, oh gosh, early 20s. And so I applied to that school thinking nothing would happen. And then I got a letter saying I got in and you know, they're like, you have, you know, X amount of days to decide if you want to do this. And I said, well, it won't hurt for me to go to orientation, at least kind of get an idea. So I pretty much went in blind, not Mm -hmm. really knowing what I was going to be doing, but I ended up loving it. So, um, yeah, pretty much, you know, for those of you who aren't aware, occupational therapy, we do a lot of, um, we, we focus a lot on the self-care aspect of people's recovery. It's very deceiving, the name. Um, no, we don't necessarily help people find jobs. We do, sometimes <laughs> we'll help people acquire the skills to get jobs, whether it's like the people skills or, you know, just like things like that. But, um, so they can work in schools with kids developing, like even just tying shoes, like really basic stuff. Um handwriting. Um, I work with a geriatric population, so I actually work in a skilled nursing setting, so I get a lot of hip sneeze backs, broken limbs, um, people with dementia, Parkinson's strokes, and basically we just work on that rehab aspect, and then mm-hmm. we figure out where they're placed long term, and they go <clears throat> home, assisted living, etc. So um, I really like it most, first and foremost, just because I get that sense of being able to help people. Yeah. Um, I think the only thing I don't like about it is just the politics of healthcare. Those kind of get in the way sometimes um, from me doing my job. Um, but in large, I mean, I just, I love it. It's it's like the perfect niche for me because no, I didn't want to, I wanted to work in healthcare, but I didn't want to be a nurse. I didn't want to be a doctor. And I, you know, that was like, well, what can I do that's still, you know, relevant to healthcare, but not one of those. <laughs> mm-hmm. Right. But Mark said, I know you said hips, knees, and backs, but I heard hip, sneeze, and backs hip and was sneeze. confused. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's great. Uh, so Bite Mark's question for you right now is, what is your favorite poem? Oh, okay. So I saw, I was thinking about that. So I don't memorize poems. My, there's just so much in my brain that I cannot memorize poems. But I did save a poem that I saw recently that I liked. Um, there is a poet who's fairly well known on social media. His name's um, Tyler Gregson or Tyler Knott. And I saw a poem recently that he posted that I really liked and it just sort of encompasses like the last year, but um, it's real quick. So I'll just read it. Yeah. It says, um, struggled, but survived the year, tied ourselves to hope and the promise of light, pin these medals to our proud chests, raise our fists to the air. We are the champions of endurance. So, Boy, that's the truth for this last mm-hmm. year. Yeah, I know. I thought that was like <laughs> really perfect. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's fantastic. Um, credits not transferring is BS. Credits not transferring is complete, complete BS. Yes, for sure. it was. And it was crazy because they pretty much told me at the time that our my school was not, didn't have the right accreditation. I said, well, how do colleges mm-hmm. get accreditation? Apparently, they have to pay some ginormous fee to some entity. I actually don't know a lot about it, but they have to pay a a giant fee to whatever entity accredits colleges. And if they don't pay that fee, then there's like certain levels of accreditation. So I could have, in theory, stayed. My college was in South Carolina. So in theory, I could have stayed anywhere around that region and my credits probably would have transferred. But because I came back home to Kansas City, there was nothing, nothing. That's ridiculous. So so ridiculous. Yep. Yep. Really dumb. (laughs) Do you have a serial killer or a true crime story that fascinates you? I was actually thinking about that, and I don't think I do, to be honest. I should have put a little more thought into that. No, no, that's listen, some some people have a (laughs) like some people immediately something comes to mind. Some people are like, eh, not really, you know. Just, just kind of. <laughs> well, I'm trying to think of even the last thing I've been watched because it's been a while. I mm-hmm. think the last thing I watched when, was when like Ted Bundy was trending again, and there was all mm-hmm. these, you know, mm-hmm. like things on Netflix being posted, and that was fascinating and horrifying at the same time. 
So. Oh, the last. So I think the last, the thing that I'm not through with yet is Hotel Cecil. So I'm in the middle of Hotel Cecil. But the last thing that I watched all the way through was Don't Fuck With Cats. And that is hard to watch. Like it's I and they don't even show the graphic parts of the videos. But I mean, it's hard. It's hard to watch. It really, truly is. It's pretty awful. <laughs> oh, Hotel Cecil, listen, it's uh, so first of all, that story has always fascinated me. And I, I remember the videos and everything. Um, and so to have it on Netflix, that that manager lady, like she's she's something else. She's something else. Um, I love that the poem question gets such a broad spectrum of answers. Yes. Oh, absolutely. We've had all sorts of stuff on here with that poem question. It's, it's great. It's a great question. So we're here today to really focus on cultural sensitivity, racism, resources for Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders. What was your experience growing up as an Asian American in the Midwest? That was a really loaded question. I was thinking about that earlier, and I don't get asked that a lot, weirdly enough. So I really kind of had to reflect on it. And um it was it was different because um, I off, I also have a really unique perspective as well being adopted into a Caucasian mm-hmm. family. So I'm not I'm not second generation Asian Americans. You know my parents are I think my mom is German and my dad is Welsh. So and they grew up in the Missouri Iowa area. Um, it was definitely different. I think for a long time and I grew up in a really tiny town in Missouri. Um, called Versailles, Missouri. And I think at the time there was like, no joke, less than 10,000 people. Mm -hmm. So, um, and we lived on like half an acre. We had one neighbor. Um, it was, it was country living. So I think for a long time as a little kid, I just, I lived that normal kid life. I didn't know differently. Um, I was thinking about it earlier and my parents never really, I mean, I knew I was adopted from mm-hmm. an early age. I mean, you couldn't look at, I couldn't look in the mirror and not know, you know, right. so it wasn't something that they could keep from me. Um, but they didn't really address Korean culture hardly at all growing up, which thinking about all this now I thought was, is actually kind of strange to me because you, in a way you would think that, I know all parents have their different approaches to parenting, but, you know, thinking back now, it's that's just something they never really talked about. And the only times as a kid that I felt different was when if somebody pointed it out essentially Mm -hmm. so right um it was it was definitely definitely really really strange and I think that um as I grew older you know the type of comments people would make to me it'd be it'd be because we kind of talked about this a little bit before the stream but like the the generalizations or you know these stereotypes like oh you know you must be good at math or do you know all these other languages or you know people even would make these really innocent comments to me growing up as saying like, wow, so you're super American. Like, and I think they meant that to be some sort of compliment. But as I think about it now, like, what did they really mean, mean by that? Like if I was more Asian, like what is being Asian to somebody, you know, is it a thick accent? Is it, I don't know. I don't, I don't, you know, there's so many Asian stereotypes that I'm thinking about all that now. I'm like, I don't really know what they were trying to get at <laughs> when they were making those kind of comments but no I, th- I would say for the law lo- the mass majority of I would say from when I was a baby up until I moved to Korea and then came back I really so I was I was eight years old when I moved to Korea um for three years I think I think that first like a little bit it was just a normal childhood you know no, I didn't feel different at mm-hmm. all <laughs> Um, but then I moved to Korea and that was a huge culture shock and it was crazy because my parents were missionaries at the time. Um, and I was, I was wondering how you got to move to Korea. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. So long story short is like my parents were missionaries back Mm -hmm. in the eighties and they worked with an organization called Nix. It's the network of international Christian schools. I don't believe it goes by that name anymore, but they've got, they've got schools like all over the, all over the world. Um, And so originally we were supposed to go to Suriname out of all places. So we had booked, um, we had sold everything and we were getting ready to go to South America. And then it came back that they had filled the contract with a, with another family and other, some other teachers. And so that fell through. Um, 
so you know my dad came to us and he's like well I really still feel you know the calling to go somewhere so you know your mom and I were in Korea in the 80s as missionaries and teachers so you know let's go back there so um <laughs> uh, I moved when I was yeah I moved when I was eight almost nine and I attended a school there and it was an English speaking school um mm. it was called the International Christian School of Seoul and uh it had at the time there were 33 different countries represented in that school so wow. um, yes super like super super culturally diverse yeah um I think some of my best friends my best friend in fourth grade and fifth grade she was her parents were the ambassadors of Guatemala to Korea um, I had some, I had a friend who was from Finland. I had a friend who was from Bangladesh, like just, you know, and as kids, you know, you don't, in a sense, you don't see those differences or mm -hmm. just somebody in your class. And so that was really, that was really, really neat. Um, the only time, the times in Korea where I felt different were if I were to go to like the corner store or something to get like a snack or whatever, and somebody would try and speak to me in the in Korean. At the time, I I mean, I grew up speaking English. I didn't know any sure. Korean when we moved to right. Korea, which was pretty crazy. Um, and so those were the times where I kind of started questioning my cultural identity. I'm like, well, mm -hmm. I'm Korean, but for all intents and purposes, I'm not Korean because I don't speak the language. I don't fit into the customs. You know, you know, I'm I'm American. Well, then. But in America, I don't look American. So mm -hmm. that I think I think coming, living in the United States and then going straight to Korea was a straight like it was a that was a huge culture shock for me. I, I know of. go you go from a town of like five thousand people and then at the time Seoul was nineteen million. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> so kind of othered in both places. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Laugh for purposes. First off, uh, Jamie, my daughter says you have beautiful hair, but hope you all are doing well. I feel most people incorrectly pinpoint Asians, for example, refer to someone as Chinese when they're Korean. We were talking about that before the stream, too. Do you personally take this as insulting or racist or just a casual mistake? By the way, you're both loved. Thank you, Kev. Thank you for being here today. Uh, love you back. And I think that's a great that's a great question. Do you, do you want to respond to that one, Jamie? Um. I think when I was younger, like teenage age, age, it used to insult me a little bit more. Um, working in working in the restaurant all the time, I would work headset. They can't see me working headset, and mm -hmm. I don't have any kind of accent other than right. Midwest. And so, a lot of times, they would, uh, I would have customers get to the window and say, "Whoa, are you who I was talking to?" <laughs> like, yep, <laughs> and they're like, "Oh well," you know. And, and we get the whole like you know, your English is really good, which I thought was very like, well, huh. thanks for making that kind of assumption. No but a shit. lot of times, <laughs> yeah, a lot of times it was, you know, I would just have strangers all the time come up to me and just start speaking to me in either Chinese or Japanese. <clears throat> they would just pick one. Oh boy. <laughs> and I go, I go, oh, well, you know, I'm Korean. Um, I think it used to really bother me as a kid. And I think, and I think now it's more of just a, I think people are curious and I can't fault curiosity. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and, you know, the most people in the world do live in China. So if you assume I'm from, <laughs> from China, I mean, that's a fairly good guess. And, you know, I I'll give them this. So Southern Chinese actually look a lot like Koreans, all, all different Asians. They have like their certain characteristics, but mm -hmm. the Southern Chinese, for whatever reason, I mean, they're closest to Korea. A lot of times we get mistaken for each other and I can, I can see that. So, um, I guess long story short, no, it doesn't, it doesn't really bother me. I think a lot of it just comes from, you know, people being curious and I think that they're just trying to connect in some sort of way. Yeah. Uh, Rocker says, do Midwesterners have accents? I truly don't believe we do. Uh, I mean, there's definitely some accents in Midwesterners. I'll say, I know that there are accents in Texas. I turn mine off most of the time. <laughs> does yours come out when you're like angry or anything like that <laughs> um it doesn't come out when i'm angry but if i have been around my family for any any like more than a day then it comes out for a couple couple days and i have to be like tone it kind of tone it back down mm -hmm. a little bit mm -hmm. <laughs> how has your lived experience changed during the pandemic it's definitely evolved. I think when this all first started, I was a lot 
a lot of the decisions I made, I think, were very, I guess, more fear-based, for lack of a better term, because we didn't know very much about the virus, and I mm-hmm. work in healthcare, but I know enough. I know enough to know, like, anything, anything that is infectious is going to affect, like, the young and the geriatric population more. So, I mean, I knew enough at the time to know, like, wow, I've got, we've got, you know, our building has around 100 people right now. Um, And and at the time, I'm like, well, I've got to do everything possible to, you know, protect our residents. I think there was one time that... I wasn't even directly exposed. It was I was around somebody who was around someone else that was directly exposed. And I think for I think last year, March or April, I think I came home and I wore a mask for like ten days or five days, whatever the recommended time was at the, at the time. So I think my perspective definitely has evolved, um, and my life has evolved. I definitely don't go to the grocery store as much, which mm-hmm. is fine. We have ordering, and I pick up, and it, it's got its own issues of you know them. <laughs> not getting things correct right (laughs) yes um and i'm i don't know i don't think in all actuality my life has changed a ton a ton because i'm i tend to be a homebody i like spending time at home and Mm -hmm. i always will be that way um it is it is strange you know not being able to just go wherever you know i things are opening up now so it's not as much as, as like that anymore but i think when this all initially started just like we're driving around and looking at all the businesses that were closed <laughs> was mm-hmm. definitely jarring so yeah, the differences in what closed and what stayed open was always uh, always interesting mm-hmm. to me. What was considered essential and, and what wasn't. Yeah, um, yeah. yeah that's... Yeah. I, I don't I, think... I think a lot of the things that have happened in, in the last year and a half are things that... Or the last year are things that, um, personally, I'll probably keep doing. I mean, I cook way more than I did before. We order out, you know, once a week. But that's really about it. And we used to order out quite a bit more or go eat somewhere quite a bit more. Uh, it would be nice to go eat somewhere. <laughs> I actually think I order out more now. To oh, really? And that's a habit. And that's a habit I'm hoping. For. I, I think it's just because I'm attached to the convenience of it so much. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's just, it's just, well, here's my DoorDash app. <laughs> or right. Grab a click. Right. Done. <laughs> yeah. That, I, I think um, it gets too expensive for me. <laughs> to order oh yeah to order all yeah. the time <laughs> so i i definitely i signed up for, with doordash because these doordash the most i definitely i have their subscription so i get yeah. like right delivery i think I yes would, makes a big I mean, difference you get your money's back in like two orders yes seriously right well i have i have the walmart delivery um subscription so that i don't have to pay for delivery every time which is nice <laughs> yeah that's definitely nice by Mark said, man, sometimes for uh, for a little while, there was no traffic. Yeah, that, there's definitely yep. traffic now again. Uh, customers sometimes still don't wear masks and then give me a look for giving them one. I like to, whenever I'm in a store or something, almost always my seven-year-old goes with me because he likes to go places. Like, he's like me. He likes to go places and then come home. Like, that's, the, that's what we both kind of like to do. Um, and he has a habit of his mask will just slip down, not, not, he doesn't like pull it down, but it'll just slip down and be like right Mm -hmm. here under his nose. And so whenever I see someone who's wearing their mask wrong, I'll turn to him and say, that mask goes over your nose, young man. (laughs) (laughs) Every time I'll see somebody else pull theirs up. (laughs) Oh yeah. I mean, I, (laughs) we've, I know we've made comments like rather loudly walking by people like, Mm -hmm. why are you even wearing it? (laughs) Yes. Yeah. Like, seriously, why are you wearing it? It's just going to sit right here. Right. Right. Oh, such a pain. Such a pain. Uh, Laugh for a Purpose says, do you find it important to keep aspects of of each culture in your life? I have mostly Irish in me and some parts of the Irish culture because of my ancestors I keep very close to me. That's a great question. Mm -hmm. I do. Um, As I've mentioned already, cultural identity was a huge, huge struggle for me when I was younger. And I think in a sense it still is. I just think I get caught up in the busyness of life or there are things that just take precedence that it just kind of gets put on the back burner. Mm -hmm. But, you know, like when things happen in the news or whatnot or, you know, occasionally when I'm talking to my parents, like that'll the issue for me personally just creeps up. And I also have an adopted older brother who's Korean. He's not biological. And it's funny because I've had conversations with him lots of times and he doesn't have any of the same I guess issues I do he's never really struggled with his cultural identity he for he's very like 
he's a country boy, but he's Korean. You know, he grew up fishing and hunting and mm-hmm. fixed up his truck. And, you know, he loves all of that stuff. And really, there he does not act very, I guess, Korean. He's not very in tune with, you know, Korean culture, Korean foods. And that's just him. And he's always been that way. But for me, I think I always struggled. Like, I had a hard time in Korea making friends with some of the other Korean kids. Um, Koreans are, and I'm going to try and say this really delicately, Koreans are a very nationalistic um, people. And I don't think inherently that's a bad thing. I think having pride in your country is a really, can be a really good thing. Um, and pride in your culture. Um, but even in school, even at, even with 33 countries represented, a lot of the Korean kids, you know, were just stayed friends with each other. And I always had a really hard time kind of integrating into those kind of friendships with them because I didn't speak Korean. Mm-hmm. You were supposed to speak English in the school. That didn't always happen like, right. at recess and whatever. And so a lot of times I would, you know, walk up to try and insert myself into kind of these these social situations as a kid. And they would immediately switch to Korean because they knew I didn't understand mm-hmm. them. And I think that was kind of the big thing. like well, what's wrong with me? I'm, you know, I'm Korean, you know, why, why aren't these people, you know, accepting of me? So I think that's kind of like where my big, like that, and then moving straight from there to Kansas, you know, and in middle school out of all years, you yeah. know, like the, those awkward years where yes. like, even wearing the wrong shoe laces, you know, I'm being dramatic, but like even the wrong, the wrong shoe laces could like put you on the outs, people like, um, but I do, I do like to answer the question. I do think it is important for me to, you know, identify as Korean, particularly now and particularly in the topics that we're talking about today with, you know, all the anti Asian hate crimes and racism. Like, and that's kind of how my connection, because at the end of the day, I can't change that, you know, I am adopted and grew up in Missouri. Mm-hmm. That's just what my life is. But I do have that choice to speak up for people who, you know, heritage and ethnicity wise, I certainly identify with. I am 100 percent. There's 100 percent Korean blood flowing through me and that won't change. And I think that in doing my research and educating myself as far as all the stuff that's kind of happened in the last year and even over the course of history in particular with, you know, Asian cultures and, and, and in relation to the United States, I think in a way that's kind of helped me accept my identity a little bit more. Um, but no, definitely. I think that I, I like, I actually really enjoy being multicultural and being, yes, I can identify with, somebody from Kansas City or Wichita on several different things, but then I can turn around and identify with somebody, you know, who I meet at the Asian market who's Korean, because I Mm -hmm. did have that experience in Korea. So that's sort of a roundabout way to answer that question. Yeah. (laughs) So I know that a lot of um, the racism that has, has been there for a long time is kind of coming to the front of things right now in the news. And uh, there was a terrible tragedy with that shooting. And, and um, it's kind of getting a lot of a lot more attention. What do you do in the face of racism? And what do you wish you could do in the face of racism if there is anything? I think, well, <laughs> when people are a little more um, obvious with it which I actually up until up until the last year I would say there really I really hadn't encountered too many instances of people being outwardly racist like in a negative way Mm -hmm. like growing up I got the stereotypes like okay so I probably shouldn't allow this as a kid but as a kid like I just wanted to fit in all through high school like there were boys in my class that would call me soy sauce or they would shout like (laughs) Asian sounding like like down the hallway I would someone would yell ching chong what are you doing And like Mm -hmm. at the time, you know, I don't think I understood the gravity of like what they were saying. (laughs) Well, and when you're in high school, you know, you just want to fit in. You just want to belong. And it's hard to Mm -hmm. reject something if it's if it's attention. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I knew they weren't meaning it to to, in a negative way. It was more their term of endearment, I guess, Mm -hmm. regardless of if it was right or wrong. Um, I don't think I really 
I would say in the last year, I've probably had more instances where I've noticed it in a more negative light than I had before. Like, I think I've mentioned before, you know, last, it was last April or May, and I was trying to find paper towels with that weird paper towel shortage we had. Yes. (laughs) And so I had to go to the grocery store, and I remember an older couple walking by me and the woman making a comment, you know, saying like, my people caused all this like and it just I think I think when I encounter stuff like that I think at first it just takes I'm, I'm taken aback to be quite frank because mm-hmm. you know like why would you like you don't even know me you don't right. you don't know the kind of person I am you're just purely judging me and making that accusation based off of my ethnicity so I think my initial reaction is that I'm usually taken aback and then my second reaction is that I'm angry mm-hmm I have never, I've, I've never said anything to anybody. Although in the moment, I think it's just because I'm just so taken aback. I'm in, the, I'm in shock, <laughs> and then I do the whole like, well, I should have said the X Y Z to them, and I didn't. Um, but I've had a lot of opportunities at work because I work with, you know, predominantly Caucasian white Americans at work, <laughs> and um, you know, I've, I've heard ca- comments here and there, and so usually I try and, you know offer my perspective, you know, I'm like, hey, you know, you you say this, but, you know, how much research have you done as far as like the crimes? Or what Mm -hmm. do you know, as far as this topic, you know, here's my perspective. And, and here's why what you might be saying might be insensitive, in a sense, you know, right. And a lot of and a lot of it actually is taken really well at work, just because, you know, when you grow up in a landlocked state, and you never go anywhere else, I, I like to think people are very much, um, products of their environment Mm -hmm. um and so when you don't get exposed to other cultures then yeah you're gonna you're gonna have a certain way of thinking and in a sense that's you know that's where I kind of have to start with you know and and, sure and that's where and and then I can kind of respond (laughs) to them yeah it's it's um hard to call people out I mean sometimes especially in like a work setting where you're you're working with with people and you have to keep it professional i'm sure that mm-hmm. that anger uh is there it's hard to um kind of consolidate that mm-hmm. yeah yeah for sure there have been moments where even recently where because i remember last march all the time at work i was hearing like oh china's doing this on purpose their purpose there's like a biological weapon and i'm just thinking mm-hmm. like this is crazy. <laughs> I didn't say anything at the time, but there's been moments like I think in particularly this year with the, all the rise and attention to the Asian hate mm-hmm. crimes where I where there are moments where the humanity in me and and like the just raw, you know, anger that I have sometimes in regards to some of this stuff is it, it, it's really hard for me not to say something at work sometimes like like yeah. look, last year all y'all were saying stuff, you know, and I didn't say a word. But because we've allowed this kind of rhetoric to rule our lives in the last year, last several years or however long, you know, that's why this stuff is happening. Mm-hmm. You know, you know, that's like kind of the root cause of it. It's because people test the waters, you know, they they say something a little bit inappropriate. Oh, well, nothing happened. And then they say something a little more inappropriate and then it moves to actions and then it moves to hate crimes. Yeah. Yeah. And there's just so much this last year has been so much just misinformation put out there and, mm-hmm. and, you know, Trump calling, calling it the China virus just over and over and over. Didn't, didn't help. It only hurt. And that, it, uh, it's one of those things that the culture, the culture around that, and you're right, it's that testing the waters because if they hear a leader saying things like that, then they're going to say, repeat those same things. And if there's not the, the response there to, to kind of quell that a little bit, it just makes it all, all the harder. Mm-hmm. Rocker sure. said slow your sushi roll I used to say that to Jamie but after a while I thought this sounds rude so even though she said no it's fine you can I still didn't anymore aside from just then above and listen that I mean that to me is a great way to handle that like if if you feel like it's rude a it, it probably is a little bit rude but if you feel like it is it's probably better to to just not you know to just not do it anymore and it's okay to be like uh, that was, that was not something that I should have done and then just not do it anymore. I mean, that's, mm-hmm. that's a good way to handle that. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, there's definitely, I think there's a definite difference between 
having an already established rapport, like yes. Rucker and I have, versus right. like if a stranger on the street said that to me, I'd be like, All right, what? Right. Come again? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for sure. Are there some things that you love about being Asian American? Oh yeah, for sure. I love, love, love being different. And, and, and by being different, I think that, I don't know, I, maybe I'm not terming that correctly. It allows me, I, I even thought about this question earlier. I'm like, how do I answer this? <laughs> so, um, I do. Cause I think it opens up those kind of conversations with people that, you know, mm -hmm. that, I can have where I get to share my culture and, and, or get to share my perspective or get to share, like, no, I didn't grow up exclusively in a landlocked state. I've lived all over. And I think that having all that life experience or the experiences that I have had, I think that actually opens up a lot of conversations. Like I work at a, I mentioned I work at a veteran's home and um, for, we have a, a lot of like Korean war vets and that mm -hmm. a lot of times that's, how I open up a conversation with them because I have to walk in, you know, to we get a new patient on caseload and I walk in as a complete stranger. And it's my job to kind of establish a rapport and establish a connection. And, you know, I might see like, you know, a Korean War vet hat or even somebody like a Vietnam War vet hat. And that's kind of where like, hey, you know, so you've spent time over in an Asian country. And then we kind of open up the conversation there and it allows me to kind of get to know my residents and, and kind of relate to them. Cause you know, people like to reminisce and they oh, yeah. like to, they like to talk about things that are a little bit, well, usually they usually like to talk about things that are a little more personal to them and, and be at, and you know, for someone to take an interest in them. And so being Asian American and and knowing and walking in already different that kind of allows me to establish certain rapports with people that ordinarily other people couldn't. So, mm -hmm. yeah, absolutely. Uh, chat is popping off. So let me scroll back a little bit. Scroll back a little bit. <laughs> Alex said, "Random line. I'm never gonna live that down <laughs> ever. It's. I mean, first of all, you will just always be random lime to me." That's fine. Second of all, <laughs> I admitted it out loud, and that was that was a mistake. I don't uh, even remember like where, <laughs> like actually, the exact circumstances of all that. <laughs> well, so I joined um, the CCG Discord, and it was just your name. I saw your name randomly, Jamie, the first time on there, and I just for some reason that that L or the J looked like an like a, an L to me, another L, and it was like I thought it was just random lime, and I didn't think twice about it. It was just me misreading your name. That was it. <laughs> and for a very long time, I can't remember when it was. Can't remember when it was that I finally realized that it wasn't random lime. And I was like, oh, I felt like an idiot. <laughs> First well, of all, probably like somebody was like talking about me or yeah, something I, in a voice so I, chat. I think that's what it was. I think someone called you Jamie and I was like, <gasps> Oh my God, it's randomly Jamie. Fuck. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes, 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 yes. Adam, hey, welcome. I'm personally thankful that the AAPI site seems to be inclusive of, of South Asians. Yep, absolutely. Different experiences and perspective um, as far as, as what you love to be, I love about being Asian American. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, likewise, I'm here for supporting, I'm here for the supporting of our Asian neighbors as I myself am Asian. Yeah, for sure more hey how are you old people love to conversate boy that is the truth yes <laughs> that is the truth and i don't know i don't know if it takes a certain personality or if it's just as you age like every i feel like every old person that i know or have known they really do like to talk <laughs> do you just not ever know the ones who don't like to talk is that what it is they just never get to know anyone <laughs> or they just there's really some no I've just like to some but yeah. again like working at a veterans home like I've I've got a lot of residents with lingering PTSD and so that's kind of the reason why they don't talk to anybody mm -hmm. to yeah. be quite frank but no and usually there's some sort of catalyst when I run into somebody that really is not looking to get to know anybody or or get to know anyone on a personal level yeah that and that's fair that's fair and valid Frost said, Lime is so good at speaking. I love her. Yes, absolutely. 
Alex, you are not the only one. It's true. <laughs> Bite Mark said, the older you get, the less you feel obligated to socialize with people you don't want to. Oh, that's a good point. That's a good point. So you should feel honored if someone uh, and the older population is, is taking the time to talk to you. Mm-hmm. That's great. Well, and also the sad thing is, is in my experience that you know, unfortunately, our geriatric population, a lot of a lot of them are seen. And I was discussing this the other day with one of my coworkers is how, unfortunately, some of our elderly are disabled. And you could go as far as to include like d- people who are disabled as well. People see them as, in a sense, inconveniences, which is a sad reality, it, it, you know, that we have. And so I think that a lot of times a lot of them go throughout their day and they actually don't have anybody that c- they can talk to. You know, so if they see the person in the grocery store line or they see their therapist come in like me or they see, you know, the CNA come by or or just anybody out in the public that'll even take a moment to have that kind of conversation with them. Yeah. Then they have a lot to say. Yeah. Because they probably haven't had that opportunity in a long time. Yep. I'll probably not be social in my old age because I'm barely social now. Listen, (laughs) you never know. Maybe you'll just have so many stories. That you you can't hold them all in. Can you tell us a little bit more about AAPI and A3PCon and what they do and who they support? Okay, so um, AAPI, the whole the official name is Stop AAPI. So it's Stop Asian and Pacific Islander Hate. And um, A3PCon and the Chinese Affirmative Action and the San Francisco State Asian American Studies Group, they actually all got together and created that coalition. And all of those groups on their own are organizations that advocate for Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders, whether it's offering them um, job opportunities or just continuing education or whether it's like being a a local community advocate for them as far as like whatever they would need. Um, Some of those Uh, coalitions also offer um, scholarships on the side as well, specifically catered towards Asian Americans. But they all kind of got together in March of last year, kind of when all of this stuff started kicking off um, and created this website pretty much to log and document um, incidences of Asian hate crimes. Because a lot of the crimes, I don't know if you all knew, but a lot of the crimes um, specifically are against the older Asian populations. And uh, if you know anything about a lot of, of the, at least Eastern Asians, um, grandma and grandpa types, they don't know English. So who are mm-hmm. they going to report these crimes to? Right. Well, nobody. And so they kind of created this whole whole website to give them a place to report what's been going on. The The website itself, you can report in 12 different languages, you know, wow. what your incident and what had happened with you. Um, the website's also really nice because it offers like um, multilingual resources for those who've been like specifically affected. You know, they advocate for local state and um, national policies to reinforce those civil and human rights um, that Asian Americans, you know, seek or that any any American would seek. Um and then they and it just it's all on paper. You can literally go there and they have as of March of this year, they in one year alone they had four thousand documented cases of Asian hate crimes. Wow. Um which is a ton. And mm-hmm. all fifty states there were and including the District of Columbia had reports. Um most of the Crimes are verbal. I think about 60% of them, whether it's someone being shouted some sort of racial slur on the, on the street. Um, a lot of the, I think, shunning. Shunning was a big one, whether, you know, you might have Asian neighbors and, and people are not speaking to them anymore. Or, mm-hmm. you know, you go to the grocery store and, you know, you're not, <laughs> they don't treat you the same as everybody yeah. else, unfortunately. You know, physical assault makes up 11% of the of the cases, which I think that's a lot, 11%, you know, out of 4,000, I think that's quite a few. Um, and then it also covers like online harassment as well, but the website, it's, it's really great because it pretty much just offers people resources on how to combat this. And it offers resources on, you know, how can you educate yourself and how can you educate those, you know, personally on everything that's going on. It's not just like a a website to just kind of spout off, you know, 
well, this happened to me and this happened to me that it's nice because mm-hmm. it offers all those extra resources um, and statistics, you know, just to kind of spread awareness. Um, it is based out of Los Angeles. A lot of the, a lot of the stuff that I'll mention today, um, fortunately and unfortunately, a lot of things are based like East coast, West coast. There's a lot less once you kind of get to my area. I was mm-hmm. looking things up yeah. earlier. There's a lot less groups. <laughs> um but yeah, so they that that's pretty much their goal is just to kind of spread awareness and keep it kind of alive. Because I know in the news, it's just like, what sensational thing can we go to next? And what sensational, you know, but it's in a sense, it's their way of just keeping the, the whole subject matter alive. Mm-hmm. Yeah, which is fantastic. Uh, Adam said also maybe they should in, in choose. Uh, blah, 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 blah. Hmm, words are hard. Uh, maybe they should include support for Urdu or people from Pakistan. I don't know if he has one. You can forward that along too. Um, interest. I mean, I think that that's a good. Surely there are there are something that they could include there. That'd be great. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I know there's a place on the website for um, feedback in particular. Um, there is a little um, anecdote there though that they're getting a lot of emails. So oh, I'm it takes sure. A little bit of time I'm for sure. them to get to them all. <laughs> Mm-hmm. Hindi is on there. Okay, so I mean, yeah, it seems like they'd probably be open if you sub- if you submit that as as something on feedback. And I did post both of those links on there, so it's on there. Uh, it's on there for you. So Adam also had a- another question here, and that is, do you feel like the hate or vitriol you have seen or experienced is analogous to what Japanese Americans in the late 1940s and South Asian Americans in after? Uh, September 2001, I understand that the experiences are incredibly different, but it all came from our differences. That's a great question. I think in a sense, yes, they, they have a little bit of correlation, but even if you go even further back from the internment camps, um, I read a really interesting article and I don't remember the name to be quite frank. I could probably find it if one of you wanted to read it, but um, I read an article that detailed all of Asian American history. And this isn't a new thing. Um, History books don't cover a lot of, I think they cover like the Chinese railroad and the world war two and the Japanese internment camps. But other than that, like Asians are largely not included like in American history books, but I mean, it it goes far, far back. Um, When the Chinese were first immigrating over to work on the railroads, literal laws were passed at the time barring um i think at the time they barred women from immigrating over from china at the time because they thought that women were coming over and then selling themselves as um sexual slaves so they were trying to combat that um some of the other laws they placed they were passed at the time was that you could not be a witness in a trial um as an Asian person. So a lot of what was happening was that there was all of these ghettos being set up in, you know, like right in the San Francisco area, but also New York, kind of like the big hubs where Mm -hmm. immigrants kind of like to gather, but you could literally go in, beat the crap out of an Asian person. But if the only witnesses were other Asians, they, by law, they could not testify in said case. Mm. So, which was awful. So, you know, lots of hate crimes, like our whole, it's, it's people try and bury it, but you know, this is a new concept, unfortunately. I think that, and which I think will segue into, you know, the whole like uh, model minority kind Mm -hmm. of thing. I think that's why it's been buried so much, but you know, I think that, I think that's definitely relatable. I've been, I've been to LA and I've been to um, the national history museum there. And I've driven by one of the, um, it's like a race car track now, but it used to be the site of a Japanese internment camp. Like it's, it's all, it wasn't that long ago <laughs> that all of this right. happened. Right. And I've, I've had residents in, um, I've had Japanese residents as patients. And I said, how did you uh, make it all the way out here to Kansas or Missouri? And they said, well, after the war, we couldn't, you know, we lived in California and we couldn't find you know, my father couldn't find a job anywhere. We had to literally move somewhere where we could find work, you know, because mm-hmm. that prejudice just unfortunately followed them. Yeah. Brucker said, I've always seen or read about how great Asians are rather in the U.S. or culturally established in their own countries compared to other people 
while growing up, they're raised in a society with utmost respect and are well-educated. But when this happened for COVID, it's just point the finger in an instant. Yeah. I feel like if this happened in the U.S., we, as in the government, would definitely try and place the blame elsewhere or say it simply wasn't them that did it. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. 100%. Uh, Adam said, I mean, from the time Chinese were brought over to work at at the rail work the railroads and beyond. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So you mentioned this model of minority and that, that is actually what I wanted to talk about. It's a perfect segue. It's like, it's mm -hmm. like you were a plant mm -hmm. <laughs> Chad. I do want to talk about that model minority narrative because there was this narrative, um, you know, for a, a long time and, and it, it still persisted and it still persists today of that model minority uh, narrative. And is that something that's harmful? And in what way is that harmful? Oh, I think it's it's hugely harmful because I think when people think of Asians, you know, there's a stereotype that we are hardworking and that we're successful and that, you know, half of us are engineers and doctors or scientists or whatever. But it, in large, that's that's not that's not true. I, I did I did my homework for this. A lot of there's a lot huge Asian population in um, in New York City. There's about a million Asians that live there. And um, I pulled directly from like the Census Bureau, all this that and, you, know, you can look it up. But like they're the federal guideline for poverty in New York is about twenty five thousand dollars. And out of the million Asians that live in New York City, 44 percent of them are either near at or below that poverty line. Mm hmm. So they're the ones that are working in the sweatshops that are barely making yeah. ends meet, that are not educated. I think when people think um, model minority, they think of like the things that are in the media, like crazy rich Asians, or there's a Netflix show called Bling Empire that follows like a whole bunch of, I think, rich, I don't know if they're Taiwanese I haven't seen the show myself. I've just seen a lot of buzz around it. But anyway, it follows, like, again, that 1% sure. population. But people see things like that, and then they equate it to Asians across the board, which is not true. <laughs> so, yeah, I think it's it's very damning. And in a way that also I think it, like, I read this somewhere, so I'm taking it from a video I saw, but I, I wanted to kind of quote it almost directly. But, um by seeing Asians as the model minority, I think that almost demonizes and hurts other ethnic ethnicities in their communities, whether it's Latino or African American, because they go, oh, well, look, the Asians, they're successful and they're the quiet ones. They just do their work and contribute to society. Like, why aren't you? That's hugely damning to mm -hmm. <laughs> like those types of like cultural movements or the awareness that we want. And, and it doesn't help it doesn't help get rid of, you know, the very real thing of systematic racism, you know? And in a way, right. I think that's also racist to just kind of like assume that all Asians are in this model minority, you know, complex or category. It's not, it's just, it's just simply not true. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, and it, and if that piece of that wealth disparity in particular gets ignored um, to some extent, then they're not providing the right level of support for the people who need it. Um, and who are still, you know, minority, like your minority populations get ignored a lot. And if you yeah. have something established that says that they can be ignored or should be ignored, then of course they're going to be ignored. Uh, their needs are going to be ignored is what I, is what I meant to say. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's almost like Asian American people are people just like the rest of us. What? <laughs> <Park, what? laughs> <Yeah. laughs> I know. I know. Donut shop owners around here be living good. Well, and, you know, it's not to say that's like saying that all, um, you know, all white people live in, in white trash neighborhoods. Like, of mm -hmm. course, that's not true. But a large population of white people and I, I, I say white people, I'm not trying to, like, compare white the white experience to anything else. I just say that because I am a white person. But um, it's like you can't say, you know, just because there's the Kardashians, that must mean that everyone who looks like the Kardashians is perfectly well off. Mm -hmm. Of course, there are going to be exceptions. Of course, there are going to be people who, who have something that works and have something that's great. But um, Bonesaw, to answer your question, I don't think working in a sweatshop is a, cho is a choice. I mean, that is clearly a choice that they had to make. But what other options did they have? And that's where mm -hmm. that piece, that opportunity piece, I think gets really narrow 
whenever you're looking at what a what a minority population has as an option and what an Asian American or Pacific Islander, what they have as an option, they get pinholed and pigeonholed um, to the point where they get excluded. And that's not that's not something that is good for anyone. And you got to think about like, I think the if just from the stories I've read, a lot of the people that work in these sweatshops for all intents and purposes, a lot of them aren't young. So imagine coming mm -hmm. over from China, Japan, or Korea, or wherever, you know, as a 40 or 50 year old woman, you know, not knowing any English, like, again, like you said, your, your right. options are very limited and you're, that's kind of the choice they have. You know, if you don't have the money or you don't have the language or the means to learn the language, you're going to just take what comes to you. And a lot of times it is those kind of sweatshop, you know, mm -hmm. environments. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. Brocker said with the successful Asian example being shown, it's just hiding the problem with the lower population that are suffering. Exactly. Yes. Big surprise. America, they show, they show what they want us to see and think. Yeah. And, and the wealth disparity, I mean, in general is growing like that wealth gap is growing hugely, especially during this pandemic. It grew even more, um, at a, a much rapid, much more rapid pace than it had been. And so that's an issue for everyone. Um, but more so in a minority population and even more so in a minority population where you have leadership of the country trying to criticize and trying to minimize their experience and trying to blame things on an entire population where it's entirely unfounded. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, yeah, the successful quote unquote successful Asian example and that model minority narrative. And I think that that starts as a kid too, right? I mean, I've seen, so my two bonus kids are Korean and they're second generation Korean. And, um, you know, my, my 14 year old, he gets a lot of crap in school for not being perfect at math. And it's like, okay, we'll give him some help. Well, he doesn't need help. He's, he's good at math. Like clearly, <laughs> You're, you're contradicting yourself there, mm -hmm. buddy. Mm -hmm. And they, I don't think that it's something that is mean spirited. I don't think that it's the intention to be, it's just that whenever you have that model minority in your head and you have that strength matrix in your head of this is what you should be good at automatically, you know, we were talking before about there's not a math gene that you can check <laughs> and mm -hmm. say, here, <laughs> you get it. <laughs> now you don't have to worry about it for the rest of your life. Or, or if there is, I, I don't maybe the, Maybe there is. And can you find it in me and just tick that box real quick? Um, yeah, it's, it's harmful for sure. Mm -hmm. And it starts early. It, exactly. Bite market doesn't take ill intent to do real harm. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. It does not take ill intent to do real harm. I love that. Yeah, it's kind of it's kind of like what I said earlier. How growing up, I used to have people tell me all the time that, like, "Wow, I act super American." I'm like, well, what do you again? What do you mean by that? <laughs> yeah, I know you're meaning that in a positive way, but in in the same sense, it's like, is, is that really mm -hmm. positive, or you know, are you just uncomfortable with things that are different than you? And then that's, I think, the core root of <laughs> what they were saying. That's it, right there. <laughs> <laughs> What do you think we could do to eliminate that issue? I'm, I'm, uh, I think you're referring back, Bonesaw. I think you're referring back to the uh, kind of sweatshop and limited choices. And you, okay, so also you said I have a lot of Mexican friends who work at me Mexican restaurants for minimum pay. Can't get a green card, but they've lived in the states for ten years plus. Minorities in general get the short end of the stick every time. Absolutely, and that's that's what I mean. Like that issue right there. I think that um, especially immigrants, there's a lot of things that could do be done on a political level to support better immigration policies. Um, and, and a lot of streamlining could be done. And it's just, I don't have the one solution. Um, and I, I don't think that anyone does, but I think as far as the options go, there's gotta be something that could be done. Mm -hmm. I don't know that we're going to come up with the, the solution on it here, but I'll, I'll take a moment and let you respond to that as well. I, my answer is very similar to yours. I don't know that I have any like one solution because I think it's just been an ongoing thing for decades and decades and decades. I think the United States claims to be, you know, this, this melting pot of, of cultures in a sense. Yes, we have a lot of cultures that live here and are, that are in, but are they, rep how well are they represented? Well, in my opinion, I don't think they're represented super well or what yeah. kind of resources are we offering to them to, you know, get their citizenships to like further themselves, live that quote, American dream. We're not, 
it's it's really not happening it's a lot of them here are cheap labor and that's the really unfortunate truth mm -hmm. Barker said i never found the example i brought up but the math today is way different than what i learned oh god yeah the simple ways to solve a problem are now different kids are told to solve them in a different manner and we were we were just talking about this in my family also <laughs> oh we did easter over the weekend on saturday and uh it was one of those things that we were talking about math in particular and how they get like graded off if they don't solve it the right way, but still get the right answer, which is frustrating to me. Um, Common core stuff. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I can see why they do it, but it just, it just, I feel like it takes longer to get to the answer. I mean, not to go off on a like super tangent, but mm -hmm. I understand teaching multiple methods. I am of the strong opinion that if you find a method that a child likes and can understand and prefer, let them stay with it. Mm -hmm. Sure, expose them to the other methods. Don't punish them for using what they're comfortable with if they're getting the right answers. Like, don't do that. And you're trying to inspire creative thinking. That's great. Like I said, expose them to the other ones. Don't count it wrong if they, if they do it the way that they like to do it. Because <laughs> that's just frustrating. Frustrating. The U.S. is a melting pot, but some have melted so low below the surface, and many others are stirring that pot with rather with a rather abusive spoon. Yeah, it hurts a lot of students that change schools. Yes, yep, yep. So, changing the subject a teeny, teeny, tiny little bit. <laughs> uh, I know you love DVD because we played together, and I haven't played in a long time. I do think eventually my hands are going to be better where I could play DVD again, and I would I would oh. love to. Um, but I know that you love <laughs> DVD. Not only did you mention in your bio, but we've played together quite a bit. Uh, how do you feel about the new DVD characters that they've introduced? And what do you think that they could have done better to be actually inclusive and provide better diversity of representation? Um, ooh, that's a loaded question. Well, so I am always incredibly thrilled when there is an Asian character model to choose from in any game, regardless of if they're meant to be Chinese, Japanese, Indian, Korean, whatever. I it always thrills me because um, I feel like I can identify, and I always will. I always will like gravitate towards um, characters that I feel look more like me too, even in like those character customization type games. Like I always try and make the person look like me, and if that's not the option, like do I have an option for a character model that's Asian? So initially like my initial thoughts are like i think that is fantastic i actually think dbd has a lot of really good representation across the board as far as ethnicities you know they've got koreans they have japanese they have uh hispanic they have um i don't know what felix is but he's european of some sort like the, i mean they're very i, I feel in large are very well represented across the board the korean one in particular so I actually think the killer looks very Korean, but I actually think they use like a specific like K-pop person and went off his actual face. Um, in my mind, I'm like, was it truly to be, and this is all just speculation. So part of me wonders, was it to truly be more inclusive or was it sort of the, well, K-pop is the popular thing right now. Should we just hop on that train for the sake of hopping on that train and then yeah. generate more buzz about the game? So, and it worked. People were talking about the game a lot more. Um, but as far as, like, the the girl character, um, Yunjin, I think was her name. Um, I was really disappointed because I, I just don't think her features at all were even Eastern Asian. She's, mm -hmm. she, I look at her and she strikes me as Caucasian. And I think that they should have put a lot more work into their source for that. Like, if they were going to put so much work into the killer and make him look very very korean i think they did a good job actually with him but then just kind of to slap something on slap a face on right. a korean character and then give her a korean name like to me i feel like oh they could have done a little bit more with that yeah like for sure yeah i mean i definitely agree with that and that's just coming from i haven't even played the game since they added not because they not because they added it i just haven't played the game in a while but um i haven't even played the game and just looking at the things that they posted and everything it's like this really looks like a white person thing mm -hmm. that you're just you've mm -hmm. just given an, an ethnic name and that's not okay um mm -hmm. 
where the killer the killer side truly does reflect kind of that culture and the the facial features and everything uh and so it's it's a little frustrating uh for me even <laughs> mm-hmm Mm -hmm. to see well, that yeah, when they first when they first teased her too i didn't so i didn't read any of her backstory or anything or even look at her name when they first teased her i'm like oh they new new survivor but she's not korean and that was like the first words out of my mouth and then come to find out later they gave her backstory and her name is like no she's 100 percent korean and i'm just like oh we didn't or, okay <laughs> right <laughs> we don't look korean right <laughs> and at the end of the day like whether people like to admit it or not like you know, people of all ethnicities, there are certain of uh, certain characteristics, like facial characteristics and physical characteristics that are uniquely Korean or uniquely mm -hmm. Chinese or you uniquely American or German or whatever. And they just it's like they took the base character model of whatever program they use, like pick female character model. It's like the original like when, if you played The Sims, you know, it's like you take you, they, pr they pick the randomized button mm -hmm. and right. whatever popped up they're like, "Well, she's Korean." <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, don't hit that randomized button in art cuz you'll come up with something crazy. That's the most yeah. random <laughs> randomizer there ever has been. Mm -hmm. Um and I and I do I will say for for DVD, like they get a lot of things right as far as representation. Um, I mean, hello, I, like Jane is my girl because she's a big girl, and that's that's I appreciate seeing that in a game. Um, and it's just one of those things that I was really disappointed to see them not take it as far as I think that they should have. Mm -hmm. She is thick, and I appreciate a thick character for sure because, like you were saying, you want a character that looks like you. You want a character that that represents you that you can mm -hmm. you know connect with. I understand it's just a video game, but it matters. It makes a difference, mm -hmm. a big mm -hmm. difference for a lot of people. Yeah, cultural sensitivity is being aware that cultural differences and similarities between people exist without assigning them a value, positive or negative, better or worse, right or wrong. Are there some ways who people are there some ways that people who are not Asian American or Pacific Islander can work towards cultural sensitivity? And what do you feel would be most helpful for other people to do? Um, yeah, I think that it doesn't need to be over overly complicated. I think that even just asking somebody what is appropriate or not appropriate, you know, before you ask a question, you mm -hmm. know, in regards to somebody's ethnicity or culture and, and, you know, pose it from a baseline of like, I'm just genuinely curious and curious to know more about you. Um, I think it's just kind of how, how you present it, you know, cause you can, I think you can encounter people all over, um, who mean well, like we've mm -hmm. talked about over and over so far, who mean well, but don't convey it in a very <laughs> eloquent way or, sure. or in a way that, you know, seems very sensitive. Um, so I think it's just taking a minute to even just think about what you're going to say instead of just like blurting out the first thing that comes to mind. Cause you know, I mean, it's, <laughs> there's nothing wrong with asking if something is okay to ask is what I'm saying. Like if yeah. you don't truly know, don't assume you know, and uh, again, just if you're even just curious about somebody's culture, just asking like, hey, do you mind if I sit down with you sometime? I'd love to just learn more about you and mm -hmm. what makes you you like even something like that. Yeah. Well, and it's that's that's what I like about trying to get to know someone is that, yes, their culture that they grew up in is part of them. Yes, their heritage is a part of them, but that's not all of them. You know, mm -hmm. you know yeah. that's not that's not everything about them. And if you phrase it that way, if you say, you know, hey, I, I just want to get to know more about you. Can we can we sit down sometime and talk? Sure, that can be part of the conversation. But then mm -hmm. that sensitivity piece of it is let's also incorporate that into your larger life narrative, right? Let's mm -hmm. let's find out what you what you learned from the way that you grew up, whether you grew up somewhere else or you grew up here in the Midwest. Let's let's talk about your whole life experience versus just this one teeny tiny piece of you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's not like I wake up every morning and, and look in the mirror and like, I'm Korean. I'm going to make sure everyone knows I'm Korean, <laughs> et cetera. Like, no, I wake up in the morning like everybody else and I get ready and I go to work and I you yeah. know, desire to do my job and do it well. Like, <laughs> that's just right. at the end of the day. Right. By Mark said not to get too far off track, I get frustrated in games where the bigger customization options are just increasing the boobs and butt. 
Like I want to build her like yeah. a hammer thrower champ, please. Yes, absolutely. I do like that about Ark that you can like make the beastly forearms. Oh, if you, you can want. make them crazy. Yes. Oh, my goal every time I made an Ark character was actually to make them look as disgusting as possible. <laughs> so I'd make these like little tight, which was horrible because then you couldn't like see over like rocks and shit. Mm-hmm. So like you'd make them really, yes. really small. With, like, these giant arms and giant legs, but then, like, you couldn't see anything as you're running through the jungles. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> yeah, my character in Ark has big, thick legs. <laughs> big old legs. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's part, that's the best part of having different cultures, being able to share them with each other. Yeah, Frost, absolutely. You wake up and debate hitting the snooze like the rest of us. I don't mm-hmm. debate hitting the snooze. I hit the snooze. That's what I hit. <laughs> I'll hit it, but I'm usually, I'm pretty good at only hitting it just once. I'm mm-hmm. not like the repeat snoozer. I don't know how people do that. <laughs> I have multiple alarms daily. <laughs> but I do have like, I do know if, if I don't get up, like it's, I, it's in my brain that I know what time I have to get up. Absolutely have to be up by this time. I don't know why I don't just set one alarm for that time. Cause I know I'm going to push it to that time. I know I'm going to every day. <laughs> More, that's what I need to do. I need to set it at the latest point possible uh, and just go on from there. So we talked about a couple of the resources for um, Asian Americans, Pacific Islanders. Can you uh, talk a little bit about your favorite ones and, and the ones that you rely on personally? Um, I... There's a couple that really kind of speak to me a little bit more. One's like, I think more of a surface level. I just, I just like it. Um, <laughs> but one's called the um, National Association of Asian American Professionals. And they have 30 different chapters. So they have it like everywhere. Kind of, I kind of looked it up. So there's plenty in Texas. There's some in my area. There's in Kansas City, LA, New York. Pretty much every major city has its own little network. And what they do is um, they elect... Um, it's a community of like all Asian elected officials for lack of a better term. And what they do is um, help spread cultural awareness, like in the workplace, offering opportunities for jobs, workshops for continuing education. And pretty much every major city, every major city has one of these entities, which is, I thought was neat. Um, The other one, which I like on a more personal level um, is called the Asian mental health collective. And, Something that a lot of people don't know is there are a very like low percentage of Asian Americans that actually go see any mental health professionals. Um, mental health is very, very stigmatized um, culturally in, in, in Asian cultures. A lot of it's based off of um, Confucianism. Um, a lot of it's based off of religion and just culture. So at least for, for Korean culture, I can speak to that. So in, with Confucianism, they are, you're, you're never supposed to show a, your vast range of like emotions. You're supposed mm-hmm. to like keep things in and, and, you know, be that model person of society. You know, you don't, you don't, you're not supposed to speak up essentially. Um, so you're taught to bury your feelings from a, a very young age. And so I like this collective because they they work to kind of break that stigma. There's tons of articles of like why, you know, there are very few Asians that show up to, you know, therapy sessions or, you know, what what is it still seen as? You know, in Asian cultures, if you talk about your mental health or talk about depression or anything that like you're just seen as straight up crazy and that you should just not make everybody uncomfortable with that kind of talk and just figure it out. Um, so I, I really like that resource because I think they really do a good job of just kind of laying it out of laying it out very specifically of, you know, yes, we know you've grown up in these kind of cultures where you're told that, you know, depression, anxiety really don't exist, or you should bury it like everybody else and just figure it out. You know, you don't have to, there are resources Mm -hmm. that can help you. There are people you can talk to. There are other Asians that go through the exact same thing. You know, I, I was reading statistics earlier about like just major depressive order, just depressive disorder. And it's, you know, huge in China and Korea and Japan. It's just, you know, culturally it's, you know, they, 
the pressures of society to succeed or, or you know, all, all that kind of thing play is it comes into play or to take care of your family or, or things like that. It's like, those are what they want you to focus on. Yeah. The mental health thing just shouldn't exist. So, right. Yeah. But it's Asian MHC.org. If anybody wants to check it out, I think it's a really, they have a lot of interesting reads on there as far as like specifically Asian catered um, mental health topics. Laffer Purse is very highly stigmatized in Asia, mostly Korea. Only 7% of Koreans seek professional treatment. And that's something, um, you know, that I, I wish it wasn't that way for, for everyone. And for very personal reasons, I, I wish that those kinds of things, um, weren't stigmatized. I wish that everyone knew that it was okay to get help and it's okay to show emotions. Um, but that is, you know, when it's something that's driven into you from childhood of you don't show emotions, you, you don't speak up. Those kinds of things are really hard to overcome for sure. Uh, I would not do well in that because I literally cry every time I watch a glee. So, you know, <laughs> it doesn't, just doesn't matter. Like I, uh, yes, my 14 year old and I were watching glee yesterday and I'm just like, bawling <laughs> had to reach for a reach for a tissue on the table but uh yeah, yeah. and i well, well even like yeah even the crazy thing is at least with korean culture too it's it's not just negative emotions they don't want you to mm -hmm. share they don't want you to share like overly like excited emotions either i i developed this really bad habit and i still do it occasionally because like, it gets pointed out to me all the time but if i'm laughing like Straight on laughing, full on smile, laugh, I will cover my mouth. And that is a very Korean thing to do is because they don't want a full smile on a Korean is like showing way too much of yourself. So culturally, a lot of the yeah. <laughs> women do it in particular is when they're laughing, they cover their smiles. Yeah. So it's just you know, don't show emotion. Yeah. I don't know. I'm the same way. I, I cry I wouldn't be able to do that. And yeah, I love absolutely. To laugh and <laughs> like, I just, <laughs> yeah, doesn't work for me. <laughs> right. what you have lived through help you relate to others in some way and have there been times where your experiences and backgrounds uh background have helped you connect with someone else oh definitely i think i touched on this earlier just particularly with um with work mm -hmm. and being able to establish this kind of connections with our veterans because veteran population is very very difficult to work with because you you know you already so many of them have all of these comorbidities anyway and health issues. And then you have to go in and nine times out of 10, they also have, you know, mental health disorder diagnosis that you have to deal with, whether it's depression or anxiety, PTSD, you know, bipolar. And, and every day I'm, I'm dealing with individuals that might have one thing or a combination of all of these things. But again, you know, if I know that they're, you know, a veteran of any kind, it's, it's even, they don't even have to be a Korean war vet or, or Vietnam, but it's just literally like, oh, you were in the military for a little bit. What branch? Oh, you were in this branch. Did you ever travel? Like, and then we get to talking about, you know, even something at, if I can connect on just one little thing, a lot of times that helps me open up the door for what I'm really trying to accomplish with my patients is therapies, you know, and, mm -hmm. and helping them get better on that physical level. But a lot of times what people don't understand is you have to connect with them on that mental level first before they even open themselves up to you to do what you want them to do physically. Yeah. Yeah. It definitely helps to make that connection. Um, for sure. Be yourself, but not too much. Yes. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Laugh for purposes, reading about Korea and mental health. I've always heard the older generation consider it weak to talk about mental health. And this has led to a huge increase in alcoholism in, in the country. Uh, is this true? Yes. I mean, Koreans are <laughs> stereotypically, <laughs> Koreans like to drink anyway. Uh, it's it's just a lot high, high rates of drinking, high rates of smoking um, in Korea. So I think that's just kind of how they deal with their issues. To be quite frank, is, you know, that's just, it's rampant over there. Mm -hmm. Just do what I do and master the art of crying out of only one eye. Boom. Cry right next to someone. They can't tell because the tears are on the other side. No. I can't. I can't do that. It's just out of all of them. Hello, Trucky, Trucker Ducky. Boy, that's challenging to say. Uh, <laughs> but hello. 
Sounds like Texans. The the um don't talk about mental health. Don't show your feelings. Yes. Yeah, definitely. I I I think if I were to watch Glee with my extended family or anything, let's be real, literally anything. If we were to watch TV that wasn't football, because every time we get together, it's just watching football. Um, every holiday, there's like some sort of game on. If we were to watch anything together and they were to see me crying, most of them would be like, what is wrong with you? <laughs> yep. <laughs> yeah, tur- and turning to drinking and smoking. Suck it up. Yep, absolutely. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So if you weren't doing what you do now, or if you had chosen a different path, what would you be doing or have done instead? And this could be anything, anything at all. I actually know the answer to this. I would be a, I, I'd be a dermatologist. I would be that person. Uh, I'm sure all of you have heard of um, Dr. Pimple Popper, whether yeah. or not you watch her videos or not. But I, I do. <laughs> love all of that. I just think there's something like really satisfying about all the stuff she does. <laughs> and I would, that would be, I would ride up my alley. I would love, I'd love to do that. Yeah. I had, um, my mom was friends with a dermatologist and they uh, used to go on like kind of double dates all the time. I would babysit for them. And I remember before prom, first of all, I borrowed a dress from her. It was beautiful, beautiful black dress, gorgeous stitching on it. Um, but I remember right before prom, I had a pimple and she was like, let me take care of that for you just real quick. It's not going to hurt. And she used one of her little tools and just took care of it real quick. And you couldn't tell at all where normally, you know, when I squeeze one, you can tell that I squeezed it. (laughs) (laughs) Yes. I love all of that. All of that stuff is always fantastic. The only thing that gets me is whenever they pop something that's like a, um, it's not a pimple. The the really big ones that can get like huge and then they pop that. A cyst. Because I can't imagine how awful that smells. And that gets to me just thinking about the smell. I I, I Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I can't I can't speak to smells. The smells I smell in a nursing home every single day. I think oh, I'm true. Like, I'm not immune to it, but it's just I'm, it's normal now. I can eat a yeah. sandwich and walk down the hallway and it smell like all sorts of smells. So, <laughs> right. That's no, I true. Get that. I, I think, I think it like splattering on me would get me more than the smell would. Yeah. Well, and, you know, sometimes she wears that, like that shield over her face. Mm-hmm. So as long as you're mm-hmm. covered there, mm-hmm. how did it even get that big? I'm, I'm always interested in the backstories of how something got to be the size that it is. But, uh, I, yeah, when I imagine something about popping it, it's always a smell that gets me. But I love all of those. They're fantastic. And the before and afters of all of her videos are wonderful. It is time for the Disney magic moment. And of course I have my wand here. So I'm going to wave this little magic wand and you get to eliminate one common opinion, misconception, or theory surrounding mental illness, disabilities, or talking about mental health. And what is it that you are eliminating? And I'll go ahead and wave that for you. Turn off. Hmm. There we go. Okay, so I was thinking about this earlier, and I was trying to, I think in my mind I was overcomplicating it, but I think that even just, I think even talking about any kind of mental health is still stigmatized. Like we'll yeah. go to work and you'll say like, hey, how's your evening? And somebody might say, oh, I had a really bad headache or whatever. Like, oh. You know, I'm sorry, you know, did you take anything for it? But to have the same conversation to go to work and and say like, hey, I was like really struggling with my anxiety or my depression was just hit me out of nowhere. Like people can't do that still. And I feel like, you know, the world would be a much better place and, and communication would be just so much better, you know, even in your interpersonal relationships if you if people felt like they could just be open like that. And I think there are a lot of people out there that are very fortunate to have those systems in place where they, yes, they can be that candid, but I think in large, it's still society as a whole is not very accepting of even just talking about those type of struggles. 
So I would eliminate that. <laughs> yeah, for sure. I mean, that's something that that I see all the time, just because it's it's one of those things that I don't I don't really I of course here talk very openly, and of course in all the communities I'm that I'm um, a part of, I talk very openly about my struggles and and really reveal kind of true feelings, kind of thing. Um, but I don't necessarily do that at work. It's one of those things that it's just still. I just don't think we're quite there yet. And I wish to God that we were because boy, wouldn't it be nice to be able to be real all the time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's that fear of being singled out for being too different. You know, yes. nobody wants to be too different or right. be seen as the quote unquote crazy person. Oh, yeah. well, that's the way they are. You know, you don't, you don't ever want that to follow you. Mm -hmm. So I think that's why a lot of times people, do, even like myself, I don't feel comfortable about just being as candid as I could be about it. Yeah. Yeah, I think I'm pretty fortunate to be. Um, I'm very fortunate to be a positive mental health champion at my work because then I do get to be a little bit more open about it. Um, but honestly, like there aren't many people at work who do open up about theirs at all, mm -hmm. which is mm -hmm. um, most sad. Laugh for a Purpose says, uh, much love sent. Mama, love you. And Jamie, thank you for being you. The world is a better place because you're in it. I have to run. It's Monday. Thank you so much, Kev, for being here. Appreciate you. I live in America and have been trained to avoid the doctor. That's how it's got that big. Yes. Abscesses are another story. Ooh, I bet those stink too. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why I'm so caught up on the smell. Like I had kids. I know smells. Uh, <laughs> taboo. Yeah, for sure. My CEO wouldn't like me if I could be real. Uh, very fortunate to have met you, you mean. Yes, Frost. I am very fortunate to have met you, for sure. When you're a kid, be yourself and who you are. And then as an adult, oh, no, no, not that. Mm -mm. Yep. Don't do that or say exactly. those things. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> Bite Mark put a question in the question queue. Whose smoke detector needs new batteries? Oh, <laughs> it's not mine. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Oh, my gosh. You guys have been hearing that the whole time. Sorry. <laughs> listen i it's, our, um, it's in our garage yeah i lived uh no i didn't i didn't live there so i had a friend in college whose smoke detector would constantly beep even whenever she would change it like she would change the batteries and legitimately it would still beep i don't know beeping yeah yep. it is how I, it is unfortunately it's been that way for a while so i think i've just it, i tune it out <laughs> yeah yep I heard it, I think I heard it like once or twice, and that was it. So either I tuned it out also, mm -hmm. or I, I spoke, or it, it was only there. Enough. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, so with that, we will open it up to any additional community questions. So if you have any questions, put them into chat. We'll make sure to ask them and talk, talk through them. Um, and I'll just, while we're waiting on additional questions, open it up to you and say if there's anything we didn't talk about or anything else you want to throw out there, you're welcome to throw it out there and just kind of hand you the hand you the floor. Oh, there's one thing. It it just made me think of it. There wasn't really anything we talked about that triggered it, but um, at the beginning, at the very beginning, I I mentioned how I have kind of a unique perspective on all this, being you know multicultural and having Caucasian parents and growing up here and having those cultural identity issues. Um, I I think my biggest thing that I would admonish of everybody, you know, who has friends who are Asian or African American or Latino is is just to you know, every once in a while just like check in on them, you know, whether mm -hmm. or not it's something that we consciously are daily struggling with, you know, we do have those moments where, you know, we feel like our ethnicity is perceived negatively and for us to try and navigate the world and deal with that at the same time gets a little yeah. gets a little tricky sometimes. I was talking to my mom on the phone, um, who I don't talk to very often, but I talked to her oh a few weeks ago, and I was really candid with her. I remember saying it was it was like right after all that that mass murder of all those women. Mm. And I said, "Mom, you know I really struggled with cultural identity growing up, and for a long time I think I almost." denied my Asian heritage because I didn't want to be seen as different, particularly when I was younger. Um, and I was telling her, I said, you know, even though I, you know, I didn't grow up in Korea, you know, my time there was really limited. 
and culturally it was just Kansas City most of my life and I said even even all those factors in play I still feel this weird sense of of sorrow that I had never felt in my entire life you know and and just seeing that story and trying to process all the emotions of how it affected me and in a sense that I felt more connected to my Asian heritage more than I ever have, you know, seeing the communities, you know, those local communities coming together and kind of rally around all those families as, you know, like, you know, they're, you know, being Asian, that's something to be super proud of actually, you know, and, and, you know, it's, if I ever felt otherwise, you know, that was really, really ignorant of me. And, uh, but that was just kind of something that, you know, kind of really struck, struck me, you know, differently is that even though, yes, I have those moments where I don't really know where I would categorize myself very specifically, you know, just given my circumstances, like even in those moments, you know, of adversity, I can still relate and still feel the connection to my, the other Asians, you know, in the world and in in my own community. So. Yeah. That's no, it's a great point to check in, check in with one another, generally speaking. And then especially if you have someone uh, who's Asian American, it's, that's something that they're facing. Like they probably haven't faced in a while, maybe in their lives, but definitely in a good long while. So it's, it's bringing up all sorts of stuff. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I can't speak for everybody, but I can say on a personal level, I feel like it's been way worse in the last year or so than it ever mm-hmm. has, you know, yep. in my whole life. Bite Mark said, "Dad would be upset about your uh about your smoke detector needing a battery. He's a retired fireman. <laughs> ah, well. So well. so pretend like <laughs> my dad is your dad and and change the battery. And change it. <laughs> battery and clean your freaking lint traps." Those are the two things. Battery, change the batteries and smoke detectors. We do do that very Clean out your lint traps. Yep, Yep, for sure. (laughs) For sure. Well, thank you so much for being here tonight. I appreciate you taking the time and having this conversation. Uh, I think we covered a lot of ground here, so it was really helpful. Bye, Marissa. Thank you so much for sharing with us and being part of the community. Yeah. Yeah, well, thank you for having me. I, I actually am really glad I got to kind of speak on this. I think as even just getting to talk about it, I think in a way that's kind of how I'm coping and dealing with it in a way that's kind of healing for me. So, um, <laughs> so now Absolutely. I, this was, this is wonderful. Yeah. And if you want to connect with Jamie, let me throw out your Twitter one more time. And then also I'm just going to, I'm just going to put out this list of resources as well that we've talked through some of them and just, if you are looking for any additional information or anything like that, feel free to click through those. Um, and there's even that donation option for, the memorial funds for the women who were murdered at those salons. So mm-hmm. um, yeah. it's all there. <clears throat> Frost said it's, it was nice meeting you. <laughs> well, nice meeting you too, Frost. Biters. <laughs> oh, throw, throw out her Twitch too. Give her a follow. There you go. Well, chat, give me just a minute. I'm going to disconnect with Jamie and then I'll be back playing some Minion Masters. But hold on. Hold on just a minute. Thank you again for taking the time out. And uh, Absolutely. we'll be right back. <laughs>